Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, I'm probably one of the luckiest guys in this room because at IHS I get to work with a lot of very smart, very capable people. And three of them are up on the podium here with me. To my immediate left is Nigel Galt, who's the chief US economist for IHS. To his left is Diego Iscaro, who's a senior economist in our European group in London. And to Diego's left is uh, Alistair Thornton, who's a senior economist in our Beijing office covering China. And we will uh, focus on those three economies. I'll provide some just broad global context, and then uh, we'll, um, we'll spend a few minutes on each of these key economies. But very importantly, we are counting on your participation in asking questions. There are question cards on your tables. I have lots of questions I could ask, but that would be boring. We're hoping that you'll have lots of questions, so feel free, write out the question, hold them up, and one of our colleagues will come pick them up, and we will uh, read them and, 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 and answer them in the, in the time that we have between now and 9 o'clock. Um, so that said, let's, let's plunge into the substance of this. And of course, the topic here is the outlook, the economic outlook for 2013 and beyond. And as we peer through the fog of uncertainty, and there's a lot of fog out there in terms of the outlook, I think there's room for a little bit of cautious optimism, very little bit, but a little bit of cautious optimism for two reasons that I'll sort of highlight um, uh, just now. Um, and that is first, we did avoid, avert a lot of crises in 2012. I mean, let's look at the things that did not happen. We did not go over the fiscal cliff in the US. And yes, there's this thing called the sequester, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. But our best guess is it will hurt growth, but it won't kill the economy. In, the, in Europe, we averted a meltdown, and we avoided the breakup of the Eurozone. China, we avoided a hard landing. Uh, we had something that could be characterized as a soft landing. So that was a, 2012 was a year in which things, bad things, really bad things didn't happen. But then separately, there's a lot of good data coming out on key economies, not every economy, but a lot of economies that suggest things may be getting a little better. I mean, for example, again, we'll go into some detail on some of these, not all of them. The US private economy is actually looking rather perky right now. And some of that perkiness, not all of it, but some of it is related to the energy boom. There was a whole panel on that earlier today. Parts of Europe, especially Northern Europe, actually growing. Germany, for example, and Scandinavia actually growing. Um, so that's not bad. Um, in fact, the mood in Germany seems to be improving. Why, I'm not sure, so sure, but it is improving. OK. Uh, China, uh, or you can say at a minimum, growth is stabilized. Maybe it's picking up. Alistair may have more thoughts on that. Um, very importantly, India and Brazil, two countries where growth slowed down very dramatically over the last year. The recent data suggest growth has bottomed out, and we're actually starting to see some signs of growth. Uh, other parts of Latin America and Asia doing fairly well. Growth rates of 5 6%. This is decent numbers. Very importantly, very importantly, Africa is now, depending on how you measure it, either the fastest growing region in the world or the second fastest growing region in the world. We've been saying this for about two years now. I noticed in this week's Economist, they kind of picked up on that theme. Uh, agreed. Uh, Africa's starting to look pretty good. But last but not least, very importantly, Japan, third largest economy in the world, finally, after having a triple dip re recession, not a double dip recession, but a triple dip recession, we think is set to grow probably by about 2% by the end of this year. Not the whole year, but, but toward the end of this year. Why? Well, you've got a new government in there under, the, under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. is starting to take very aggressive action on fiscal policy. He's brought in a new head of the Jap uh, Bank of Japan, this, their central bank, who has said in so many words, we will do whatever we can do to stop deflation and get the economy going. That's very, very important. Let me just give a little context on this one. Japan was very late to the party. What party am I talking about? 
I'm talking about the aggressive monetary stimulus party that the Fed did, that the European Central Bank did, that the Bank of England did. Japan was very reluctant. I just give you, uh, I'm not going to throw out a lot of numbers here, but let me just give you one set. What, what a lot of these central banks did was they bought massive amounts of government securities, government bonds, basically. And it's referred to as a balance sheet expansion. Basically, they bought up all these bonds and increased their balance sheets. In Japan, that increase over the last six years was 35%. Now, okay, fine. European Central Bank, 200%. Federal Reserve Bank, 300%. Bank of England, 500%. So if the Bank of Japan does anything like this over the next year, two years, it will turn things around in Japan, it will get rid of the deflation, and get, the, again, the third largest economy in the world growing. We think it will succeed. So all of these are good pieces of news, something we can cheer about, but that said, don't break out the champagne quite yet. We're not quite done with some of these problems. And I would characterize three kinds of problems going forward and three things that could get in the way. Policy mistakes, political risks, and geopolitical risks. In the case of the US, I mean, the good news, it's a good news, bad news story. Good news is the US is actually making progress on deficit reduction. The bad news is this is probably the worst possible way of doing it. In the case of the Eurozone, we've seen the election results in Italy recently, but this is one of many elections we've had. The French one last year essentially produced similar results. A big, big thumbs down for austerity and structural reforms. Despite the fact that both of these economies have major problems, essentially the electorate is saying, enough's enough. That margin in Italy last week was two to one of voters essentially saying, basta, which of course in Italian means enough. So that, that leaves a huge challenge going forward for Europe. Germany facing elections in September. Uh, I'm, my guessing is that the German electorate is quite grumpy right now. So any, anything could happen in September. China, it's a different challenge. Again, Alistair will talk a little bit about this. The, the problem that China has is trying to do two things at once. It's trying to get growth going again and yet not reignite and reinflate a real estate bubble. And it's not having a lot of luck uh, uh, as far as we can tell. And then there's geopolitics, obviously. Middle East, uh, uh, even, even uh, uh, East Asia, you've got the North Korean situation, you've got the spat between the Chinese and the Japanese. So the point here is this. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, and this is sort of the bottom line very quickly, not out of the woods yet, but I have to say, we can probably stop holding our breath and maybe breathe a little bit more easily uh, in the coming year uh, because some of the underlying economic dynamics seem to have improved.